to be the most compelling argument for uh, construction, uh, the construction of ancient megalithic sites. I'll be talking a lot about materials, styles, pyramids, megaliths, and possible ages uh, for these sites. Whether the pyramids are old or not, evidence still shows that there was a group or groups of people who knew about how things should be laid out in terms of astronomical connection uh, far before, far previous to the date that uh, mainstream history says. So, um, I'm going to start with megaliths. Uh, what are megaliths? A megalith is a large stone that has been used to construct a structure or monument, uh, either alone or together with other large stones. There are me megalithic sites all over the world, literally all over the world. I'm going to be starting with Giza, just because um, most people know the three great pyramids at Giza. So, um, I'm going to give the, the mainstream history uh, view of what Giza is. It's actually, it's, it's considered, it's called the Giza Necropolis. It's, you know, it includes the three uh, great pyramids as well as seven smaller unfinished pyramids. So let's talk about the, the great pyramid at Giza, the, the largest pyramid at Giza. Egyptologists believe the pyramid was constructed over a 14 to 20 year period. They're not sure if it was, you know, 14 or as much as 20 years, uh, around 4,500 years ago. Uh, there are different estimates to how many stones are actually in the pyramid itself, from a, from a low estimate of uh, 630,000 stones to a high estimate of 2.4 or about 2.5 million stones, these are including the, the inner stones, and then actually on the outside there would have been, there are stones, there were stones there that are not there now, they've been removed uh, whenever, a thousand years ago or longer. So if you take the low estimate, well, let's take the high estimate first. If you take the high estimate of about 2.5 million stones and you divide two and a half million into uh, 20 years, you get uh, that they would have been having to place one stone every four and a half minutes, day and night, for 20 years. Uh, these stones ranged from 20 to more than 30 tons each. A ton, if you don't know what a ton is, this is for, I think everyone knows what a ton is, but a ton is about the size of a small car. A small car weighs about one ton. I don't know, not a small car, not a mini car, but a, not a Land Rover or something. That might be a little bit heavier, a truck. Um, so, for the high estimate of number of stones, for 2.5 million stones, that would be four and a half minutes for each stone. If you take the low estimate of uh, uh, 6 uh, 630,000 stones, that's about 17, every 17 minutes, one stone every 17 minutes for 20 years. What I'm trying to show is, if, if you can imagine that, we don't know how they built the pyramids, but that's a, that's, that's a lot of work. I mean, imagine doing anything for every four or 17 minutes for 20 years. And then imagine that's putting two to 30 ton blocks of stone in perfect places. All right, so the three pyramids, uh, the three great pyramids at Giza were supposedly built as tombs for the, the pharaohs Khufu, Khafre, and Menkare. Uh, like I mentioned, there are also seven smaller pyramids at the site. Uh, some of them are not finished. So I'm going to be talking about uh, construction styles, uh, meaning what, what, what are the different shapes that pyramids come in. Right now I'm just focusing on Egypt, so um, other places in the world. Every, every, place, every place in the world you go, um, the pyramids are shaped differently and constructed differently. Okay, so I'm going to be talking about the pyramids in Egypt. There are 67 pyramidal construct or pyramid-shaped constructions along the Nile. Uh, so there's a, there's a stepped pyramid. I don't know if you've seen that one, kind of shaped like this, like steps. Uh, that's at Saqqara. Um, there's a flat 
topped pyramid. Uh, there's a sunken pyramid that's actually in a mountain. If you can imagine a mountain going up and then a, an open topped pyramid actually built down into the mountain. Um, but, but interestingly, if you take the, say, the three pyramids at Giza, there are three similar pyramids to that at Dashur. The Red Pyramid, the White Pyramid, and the Bent Pyramid. Um, these were these were smooth when when they were built. These were smooth sided pyramids uh, with you can imagine you can't make stones if you're building in blocks. They're going to be it's going to be bumpy. So then you need to put a casing stone on the outside of that. Um, and they did that. So the the pyramids at um, Dashur, the the three pyramids Dashur, the red, white, and bent pyramids. Uh, we're actually just like, or very similar to the pyramids of Giza. We're also smooth-sided. Um, evidence suggests that the bent pyramid was black. So you, at Dashur, you would have a red pyramid, a white pyramid, and a black pyramid. Evidence also shows that the three pyramids of Giza were also red, white, and black at some point after they were finished. Okay, so that's an introduction to styles. Now I want to ask you, what are the largest constructions on Earth now? You might think a building, but they're actually dams. The largest constructions on Earth now are dams. And what do we use dams for? I ask that question and people usually come back with either storing water or generating electricity. So now I'm going to try to show how the pyramids were used to create and store electrical energy. This is going to get a little bit, um, uh, a little strange, so bear with me. <laughs> uh, some of you have probably studied uh, a bit about this kind of stuff, so you, you might understand this already, but um, there are natural concentrations of electromagnetic magnetic energy uh, around the Earth. They're called telluric currents. A telluric current is an electric current which moves underground or through the sea. Uh, telluric, telluric currents can result from both natural and human-made uh, causes. Um, <clears throat> these telluric currents uh, overlap and interact um, in kind of patterns. The currents are extremely low frequency and travel over very large areas where you have two of these um, current lines uh, cross each other is called a conductivity discontinuity. Um, this is where in, in, in England they call them ley lines, in China they call them dragon lines. That's where these lines would meet and, and interact. So, you know, I'm, I'm talking about Giza now, I'm talking about actually these pyramidal sites in, in, in Egypt now, but if you could take any of these uh, major uh, megalithic sites around the world and they're usually where two lines meet. <sighs> Phone call. Sorry. <laughs> uh, so, I'm going to talk about, uh, as long as we understand that there are these energies, um, now I'm going to talk about the, what, what the pyramids are made out of. Uh, the core of the Pyramid of Giza, what you, when you look at the Pyramid of Giza, you're seeing the core stones. The casing stones are no longer there. Uh, they've been removed over time. Um, okay, so the, the core stones at Giza are made of dolomite. Dolomite is a, a high magnesium limestone. It's a, it's a, being high magnesium, it's a, a, a better conductor than other limestone. Granite is used in the um, corridors and chambers inside of the Great Pyramid. Uh, granite is slightly radioactive. Uh, and will ionize and electrify the air. It also gives off radon gas. The casing stones, which don't exist anymore, but there are still some, you can find pictures where there are still some 
casing stones stacked up around the base of the pyramid. Uh, the casing stones were made out of a different kind of limestone with, with no um, magnesium content. So they were actually acted as a, an insulator. So what you have is like, if you can imagine a wire, uh, there aren't any wires around here, but if you can imagine a wire where the, the center of the wire is the conductor and the outside of the wire is the insulator, and that's basically how uh, the pyramid, pyramids worked, some pyramids. Not all pyramids were built for this reason. <clears throat> so um, this gets into um, what are called subtle energies, uh, qi in China, prada in India. This would have been something that ancient people would have known about and would have studied. When night changes into day, at, at nighttime, there's very, very low levels of this electromagnetic energy. And in daytime, there's very high levels because you have the sun beating down on the earth. But when, when it changes from day to night, you have the largest change in a short period of time of that electromagnetic energy. Um, so you have a, a very large upswing in the electromagnetic energy. Wherever you have a changing magnetic field, you generate an electric current in anything that will conduct electricity. That's uh, a simple physics thing called induction. Physics thing. I'm glad I can call it a thing. Uh, <clears throat> so you have the casing stones as, a, as an insulator. You have the core stones as a conductor and then the passageways on the inside, um, an even better conductor. And uh, the electrified shafts on the inside and the whole system were sort of worked as a car bat like, like a car battery where um, when you're not running the motor, um, it's going to keep some of that energy inside. So even when, it, when it's nighttime, there's not lots of electromagnetic energy coming in, you're still going to store a lot of that on the inside. Uh, it, would, it would not all dissipate. You might ask, if the pyramids were built for this reason, uh, why don't they do anything now? Why, why, why are they not glowing or creating electricity now? There is a story uh, of this German electrical pioneer named Siemens. I don't know if you've heard of him, you've probably heard of the company uh, Siemens, but there was a German electrical pioneer named Siemens, and there's a unit of uh, conductance named after him. He was in Egypt in the late 1800s, and he climbed up to the top of the Great Pyramid with his guide and uh, a couple of other people, and he was noticing that there was a lot of static electricity in the air. He was like, he was sort of feeling it, you know, his hair is standing on edge. And he took a, he improvised what's called a, a Leyden jar. He took a wine bottle and stuffed it. I can't remember what he stuffed it with. That's not important. But anyway, let me describe a Leyden jar. A Leyden jar is a device that stores static electricity between two electrodes, uh, one inside the jar, one outside the jar. It was invented uh, independently by two different people, um, a German and uh, a, Dutch a Dutch scientist, <coughs> one year after the other. He made the, uh, so Siemens makes the Leyden jar, and uh, as soon as he, he sort of holds it up and sparks started flying off the top of the jar, he eventually accidentally touched um, one of the other people with it and knocked him to the ground. So. This guy, Siemens, was obviously, he, he understood the whole process going on there. Uh, the mainstream argument for the pyramids is that they were built as tombs. Um, the, the, the Great Pyramid was built, was supposedly built for Khufu. Uh, it's supposed to be, have, you know, would have been the, the tomb of Khufu. The, the second largest pyramid would have been the tomb for Khafre, and the third largest would have been for Menkare. But let me, let me talk about tombs versus pyramids. Um, in, in every tomb, real tomb that we find, we find a lot of art inside of that tomb. Not only just art inside of that tomb, but um, the, 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 the person who is buried there has his name there as well. 
Um, the Great Pyramids have no art in them whatsoever. There is not a single piece of art in any of them. Um, there might be one thing I'll mention later um, that's too long to get into now. Seven minutes left, really. That's been 23 minutes. No, it's been 13 minutes. 15 minutes, okay. Um, all right, the, t the tombs are usually located in groups, such as the Valley of the Kings. Um, there are uh, these three pyramids that are tombs. Uh, the Step Pyramid was a tomb, the Flat Top Pyramid was a tomb, and, and inside of these pyramids, there is a lot of art inside of those ones and the person's name. All right, that, uh, the Great Pyramids, they never found mummies inside of either, so. All right, you can look, take a look at these pictures now. Um, the first picture, uh, uh, no, I don't need them, take, take a look at them. Um, the first picture, I, did, I didn't actually want them to get split up like that because you don't know which one is the first picture. Uh, but the first picture is a picture of uh, trilithon construction. Trilithon refers to two upright pillars with another pillar on top of it. Um, the picture that you have there, they're, they're in a stack, yeah, they should be in a stack. You keep them in a stack or else you'll never know what I'm talking about. Um, the first picture there is uh, uh, trilithon construction. That's at the Giza necropolis, but at a, at a lower area, there are a lot of constructions where the pyramids are around the pyramids that are, that are below, uh, set below the pyramids. And, um, and that's a picture of one of them. There are also, there's also trilithon cons construction at uh, Abydos is another place, and at Stonehenge is probably the most famous place of that kind of construction. <laughs> this, this trilithon construction is usually uh, connected with uh, aquifers also under the, the constructions. There are aquifers under Stonehenge and aquifers under uh, the pyramids. Why aquifers? Uh, moving water creates electricity. As the Nile uh, moved up and down with the seasons, it would have uh, flooded the aquifers. There are tunnels underneath the pyramids uh, that connected to the aquifers that would have also had water inside of them. Uh, okay. Uh, just as a side note, if anyone knows who Nikola Tesla was, he was a guy trying to create, um, well, he did create, he, he invented alternating current, uh, but he was trying to create free electricity for everyone. When he built his Tesla tower, he had tunnels, a tunnel going down and shafts going down to the aquifers underneath that as well. All right, since I'm running out of time, I'm going to have to push through this. How old are these sites? I think. What, what I want to show is that it's possible that these sites are not just tombs. And then I want to talk about how old are these sites. Now this is going to get on to the next picture. So the first picture is the trilophon construction. Then you'll see a picture, um, what looks like a stone circle. No, no, it's right here. <clears throat> what looks like a stone, a small stone circle, like some sort of uh, stonehenge. Um, that's that's at Nat to Playa, which is um, about 100 kilometers west of the Nile, very close to the Sudan border, so in the very south of Egypt. It's a solar planetary star chart, approximately 10,000 years old. If you go another 300 kilometers to the west, you're getting farther and farther away from the Nile. You get to this place called Abu Balas. That's not one of the pictures. Just if you look, just we're just on the first two pictures, so you'll see Nab to Playa is the second picture. Abu Balas uh, was actually a trade route, and this gets into a whole another thing, like who are they trading with, and, and there are new books coming out about that stuff. Um, close to that, south of that, there's a place called the Eight Bells, and these places like Abu Balas and the Eight Bells look like they're really old pyramids, or at least mounds that were created to, to you know, so people could find their way through the, through the desert. There's another place called Cave of the Swimmers. If, if anyone saw The English Patient, it was made famous in that movie that the woman dies or is laid to rest in the Cave of the Swimmers. 
Now, I think if you think about that, why would there be cave paintings of swimmers? This is extremely far from any water. It's out in the middle of the desert. It's 600 kilometers from from anything re uh, resembling water. All right. So, how old are these sites? And if these sites are as old as the last ice age, then it is possible that Giza was at least started that long ago. So next to the last in Egypt, I want, I'll come to the Sphinx. And I think a lot of us know what the Sphinx is. The Sphinx is a cat, basically, with a pharaoh's head, or a lion with a pharaoh's head. Um, study by uh, an American geologist has shown that there's, wa there's, there's weathering uh, um, erosion uh, in, the, um, in, the, in the walls around uh, the Sphinx. The Sphinx was actually, the, the, it was carved, they carved down into the ground um, to build the Sphinx. It wasn't blocks of stone built on top. There were some blocks of stone built on top, but most of it was actually car carved out of solid rock. Um, there's water weathering on the base of the Sphinx and on its enclosure. And the estimate is that this water weathering would have taken hundreds to even thousands of years to be created. And it hasn't rained in Egypt really uh, since about 5,000 years ago. And the, the Sphinx was said to be made about 4,500 years ago. So uh, this, this geologist says that the Sphinx is at least 7,000 years old, and if not more, maybe 9,000 years old. So the other thing is, and this is my last thing in Egypt, and then I'm going to move on to these, the rest of these pictures. Um, the Nile has migrated uh, over tens of thousands of years till, if you imagine the Nile is here now, the cave of the swimmers is out here, but at some point the Nile bent in like a, like a pregnant belly. And uh, over tens of thousands of years it migrated, and, it, and at some point about uh, 5,000 years ago it was close to you know, where the Great Pyramids of Giza are now, and, and it's actually then since migrated even further away from that. All right. The main body of my speech has been about Egypt, because we're all familiar with it in one way or another. I want to spend a few minutes talking about sites in Peru and Bolivia. Just to give a small comparison, I, originally I wanted to talk about every single megalithic site all around the world, and I could have talked for, for hours, and that's impossible. So I'm just going to talk about a few sites here. There's actually one, um, two, three, four, five. Five sites, and I think there are about uh, seven pictures or so. So if you pull off that first page, the, the, the first thing that you'll see there is a place called Chanquilo Observatory. Um, if, you, if, you, if, you, if you've got all the pages out of order, you won't necessarily know which one it is. But, um, yeah, no problem. So the Chanquilo, I'll just read through this. The Chanquilo Observatory is an ancient monumental complex in the Peruvian coastal desert. Uh, the picture actually shows th this thing called the 13 Towers, which is a solar observatory. That's it there. Um, it doesn't actually show the Chanquilo Fort itself. The picture doesn't show the Chanquilo Fort itself, but it shows the 13 Towers, uh, which were built on top of a mountain so that people could keep track of the sun and keep track of the seasons. The next place is probably a pyramid that you, you've never seen before. It has a, a circle in front of it, if you're looking for the picture. That's, that's, uh, that, that's the main pyramid uh, at Caral in, in Peru. Uh, it's dated uh, between 2600 BCE and 2000 BCE, which is you know, what mainstream history says is the age of the Great Pyramids at Giza as well. Um, at this point, uh, or at some point, scientists believed it was the largest uh, urban center in the Americas at the time. Uh, now, other sites are being found nearby, so maybe they think it's not. The next picture, there are, the, the next page is actually two pictures of the same site. I think two pictures of the same site. Yeah, and what you'll notice uh, from that picture um, 
is that there are some very large stones and then a lot of much smaller stones. That place is called Ollante Tambo in Peru. Uh, mainstream history says that it was built by the Incan people. But as far as I can figure out, it was captured by the Incan people, destroyed, and then rebuilt. And that's why.